You're listening to Radio Free Radio. I want to know something and if Denver won't tell me, may I ask them? Do you feel strong? When? When you write? On memory? Do you believe in memory? And credibility? Do you have winter weather here? You've just heard an excerpt from Dan Warner's musical setting for a play by Gertrude Stein called An Exercise in Analysis. You'll be hearing more of that piece as well as words from the composer very soon. My name is Adam Frank. I'm the host of Radio Free Radio, a broadcast supported by the Public Humanities Hub at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. I teach in the English department here and for the past few years have been producing musical audio dramas or melodramas based on a handful of Gertrude Stein's early plays. The project is called Radio Free Stein, and some of you listening may already know the website where I've been posting audio and other material. These episodes of Radio Free Radio will be archived there as well, starting with today's and every second Wednesdays for the next couple of months. I'll be talking to composers, playing excerpts from the recordings, and holding a Q&A with listeners via Zoom. The Zoom link for this Q&A is on the YouTube page that you're listening to this broadcast from, as well as on the Radio Free Stein website. That's radiofreestein.com forward slash plays forward slash broadcasts. And if you're currently in the Zoom waiting room, I'll be uh, admitting people in the waiting room during the Q&A in about half an hour or 40 minutes. Before introducing Dan Warner and his musical setting, in this first episode, I want to say a few words to give some context for the project as a whole. Gertrude Stein, that queer woman, Jewish, American punk modernist writer, wrote between 80 and 100 plays and theatrical works, depending on how you count. A few of these have received substantive critical treatment, the ones that have entered the performance repertoire, including the two operas, Four Saints and Three Acts, and The Mother of Us All, with music by Virgil Thompson, and the play, Dr. Faustus Lights the Lights. A few more have been performed in the decades since she wrote them, but not many, especially of the early ones from the 19-teens, have received serious critical attention. While there's no question that Stein's landscape theater poetics have been influential, important for critics and historians of 20th century theater and especially postmodern theater, the poetics have received much more attention than the plays themselves. In fact, Stein took most of the conventions of written drama and threw them out the window. Her plays are still challenging to read. There's no clear plot or story. They may or may not include characters or settings, and they tend not to distinguish between dialogue, stage direction, or other theatrical elements. Her plays seem to reject mimesis altogether, and the hierarchy elaborated in Aristotle's Poetics, in which plot and character take precedence over speech, song, and spectacle. And yet, her plays do recreate something. She tells us what this is in her lecture on plays. Here's a quote from her lecture. I had, before I began writing plays, written many portraits. I had been enormously interested all my life in finding out what made each one that one, and so I had written a great many portraits. I came to think that since each each one is that one, and that there are a number of them, each one being that one, the only way to express this thing, each one being that one, and there being a number of them knowing each other, was in a play. So for Stein, literary forms let us know different kinds of things. If portraits are for knowing individual persons, then plays, at least as Stein understands them, are for knowing aggregates of persons. They are, in a sense, group portraits. Plays recreate or explore the dynamics of a number of individuals in relation, especially in epistemological relation as they try to know each other, an aggregate that may well include the performers of the play as well as the audience. So I think of Stein's plays as reflexive experiments in audience and group psychology. In my research, I found it helpful to approach Stein's theater by way of several theories of affect or emotion, and in particular, the object relations theory of Wilfred Bion, that's B-I-O-N. Bion was Samuel Beckett's analyst in the mid-1930s, so possibly already an important if overlooked player in the history of 20th century theater. A a member of the Kleinian group, those who followed Melanie Klein and her unorthodox departures from classical Freudian theory, Bion coined the phrase group therapy, by which he meant not the therapy of the individual in a group, but the therapy of the group as such. His approach to groups, as well as the theory of thinking that he evolved over the course of the 1960s, is very much in the background of the Radio Freestein project. 
I won't get into the details now, but briefly, by contrast with naturalist drama, where the portrayal of a number of individuals in relation requires story, where plot and character become functions of one another, Stein portrays group relations without the help of narrative. Here's another quote from her lecture. In my early plays, I tried to tell what happened without telling stories so that the essence of what happened would be like the essence of the portraits, what made what happened be what it was. She doesn't mean that there's no story to tell. Rather, here's another quote, the story is only of importance if you like to tell or like to hear a story, but the relation is there anyway. So, how do Stein's plays recreate group relations without story? And how can a reader discover the dynamics that are being portrayed or explored? In the Radio Free Stein project, the first step toward answering these questions has involved holding a brainstorming workshop with a number of readers. It's as if it takes a group to arrive at a feeling for the play's group. I invite a composer who's agreed to work with me on a given play, as well as a handful of good, available Stein readers, colleagues, fellow critics, poets, a couple of graduate students. The workshop is mostly unstructured, and participants get to grapple with the meanings and feelings that emerge from airing, airing Stein's words, making them move or circulate off the page. The workshops tend to begin in disorientation and confusion, but somehow, two hours later, we arrive at tentative answers to questions like, how many voices are there? What's the structure of the play? Is there a situation or a setting? This experience of being almost comically mystified before arriving at some more stable sense of Stein's work has been typical of the nine workshops I've held for this project so far. The process has been surprisingly reliable. Not that participants always agree about how to answer these questions, nor even whether there always needs to be an answer, the disagreements have been at times significant. As Bion explains in his writing, groups are inevitably frustrating for the individuals comprising them, in part because, according to him, they're a result of regressive fantasy. But at the same time, groups are necessary for some tasks to get done. I think that understanding a Stein play is a group task. So as a critic, my basic question has been, what can a reader of these plays think and say about them after undergoing the process of staging them sonically? in the form of radio melodrama, what could come from these intensive collaborations that I might not arrive at on my own? Uh, quite a lot, it turns out, and I'm now writing up my results, as it were, preparing a book called Radio Free Stein Boxed Set. But in the meantime, I wanted to share the work we've done in a broadcast format that's well suited to the project and our ongoing pandemic moment. So now let me welcome Dan Warner, who's joining us on Zoom. Um, Daniel Warner is professor of music at Hampshire College, holds an MFA and a PhD in music from Princeton University. He's a composer and electronic artist whose sound and installation work has been presented at the Festival Synthèse in Bourges, France, the Victoria Independent Film and Video Festival in Vancouver, the AV Festival in Newcastle, UK, and most recently at the Science and Squares Festival in Manchester. He is co-editor of Audio Culture, Readings and Modern Music, by Blooms, published by Bloomsbury, and his latest book, Live Wires, A History of Electronic Music, is published by Reaction Books in London. Welcome, Dan. Thank you for being you. here. Lovely. Thank you. So um, a few years ago, you very happily for me agreed to work uh, with me on Stein's and Exercise and Analysis from 1917. So I guess my first question is, uh, why did you agree to do it? And uh, did you have much interest in Stein before before this? I uh, I had no other other than knowing the uh, work that Virgil Thompson had done uh, with uh, Gertrude Stein. I certainly knew some of her some of her uh, work, but I didn't know any of these very early plays. And um, it was very exciting for me to think about something that was a somewhat of an untapped resource. Um, and I thought that for me, that was the most exciting thing to look into, to look into this, these plays, look into this language and see what I might be able to do with it musically. Yeah, that's great. One of the things that I've been really intent on in the project is asking composers to make use of the material in a way that serves their own purposes, their own compositional thinking. So yeah. I guess one question is how did, how did that work for you? Well, it worked really well. One of the things that I did, and um, uh, I, I'm a composer, of course, not a literary theorist, 
Um, but I, I, I tried to read up a little bit on the, on the early plays. I couldn't find very much, but I did find a few things that really helped me um, get a kind of jumping off point. Um, the first thing, well, the first thing was when we did our workshop, we read through the play as a group uh, that afternoon, as well as had a lengthy discussion about the play and its potential meanings and its potential uh, energy, if you will. Um, but I also, I also did a little reading and I, I found a very interesting quote that really helped me. Um, it's a writer called uh, Jane Bowers um, who uh, says, uh, Stein treats her words as though they are material objects related to each other spatially that is visually on the page and sonorously in the air. And I thought that that was a really, really great way for me to, to sort of launch uh, my, my work with this, which was to think of the words as, um, you know, really, really sonorous objects as, as we would say in electronic music. And this setting of course is an electronic setting. So uh, that's, why I, what, that's why I mentioned that. Um, I think the other thing that, that, that really struck me was that um, uh, another writer that I, uh, that I looked at uh, notes that uh, uh, in Stein's early plays, there's an astounding implication that, um, I'm sort of paraphrasing here, an astounding implication that can be flushed from the ordinariness of language. Can you repeat that quote just one more time? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the one writer notes that Stein's plays reveal the astounding implications that can be flushed from the ordinariness of language. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, just sorry. I think when you, with your paper was on right on top of the microphone there, so it was a little I'm bit hard to hear. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. The ordinariness of language is certainly one of the big uh, elements of Stein's writing since she's always working with ordinary language. She doesn't tend to use obscure or elusive language. She tends to use everyday language and that's really crucial for her as well as the ordinariness of her circumstances and situation always bringing in the circumstances of her writing into the writing itself and that's yes. part of its materiality what you're calling you know the sonorousness and you know jane yeah. bowers excellent book uh they watch me as they watch this on stein's meta theater is really one of the classics uh, uh in in the criticism of stein's theater um yeah, that's that's something that uh, that we, we we began talking a little bit about the sonorousness of the language in the workshops. So um, I'll just say a couple of words about that workshop. We held it in 2015 at UBC, uh, and Peter and Meredith Quarterman were there, as well as Janie Dodd, Claire Laville, and Aaron Peck, uh, and Dan, of course. And then Michael Moon, um, who we invited, couldn't make it, but sent in some helpful reading notes. And one of the things that he noticed about the play uh, is that the play itself has this dueling or cutting quality uh, that, that she, he related it to the classical Greek dramatic practice of stichomythia, um, where alternating verse lines are spoken by different characters in argument or dispute. And it put me in mind of screwball comedies of the 1930s, where there's extremely fast back and forth between the, the characters. And that does seem to be part of what's going on in this play. Um, how did that uh, work itself out compositionally for you, thinking about the different sort of back and forthness or even the humor and wit in Stein's words? Well, um, as you know, what I did to create the source material for the, for the play, uh, for the, I'm calling it a kind of chamber, electronic chamber opera or a radio play, uh, was I asked you to organize uh, uh, readers to actually read the play. And so I relied very much then on the rhythms and phrasing and rhythms and even meter, if you will, that came as a result of the actors themselves. So I took that material, I took that recorded material and I decided that what I was gonna do was I was basically going to use a, an electronic device called a vocoder mm. to basically transfer those speech, those utterances uh, into musical lines, if you will. And so I actually, I actually maintained the original, more or less the original rhythms, uh, speech rhythms of the, of the actors themselves. So that pr for me provided a wonderful, uh, a, a, a wonderful, um, 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 
if you will, sort of sonic landscape that was already there. I was able to sort of pick up on the rhythm that that uh, that the the readers themselves generated as they read as they read the play together, uh, much as we did that same that day of the of the workshop. By the way, it was uh, it was clear to me how important it was for these words to be sounded, and I believe that that was something that um, you know that the that Gertrude Stein was very adamant about that these were to be sounded, these were to be not just read but spoken. Absolutely. In, in some- yeah, Stein makes a point of uh, of saying that she actually wants her plays played and, uh, in fact, refused to publish some of the early plays be- because they had not been played yet. And there's that convention in, in theater that you're not supposed to publish a play until it's been it's been performed. And so yeah. she actually didn't publish some of the very early ones in the 19-teens, uh, but then she realized that they weren't going to be performed anytime soon. And so geography and plays, she let a whole bunch of them come out there. That's great. That's great. Yeah, it's a. It's for me. It was really exciting, also, because um, I I did really try to take very seriously the idea that um, there's there is some kind of meaning or multiple meanings that emerge from the son the, the sonification, if you will, of these of these words, and it was something that I really did. Uh, thinking that uh, I was just going to try to set this language and whatever meanings came out of it, uh, come what may, right? I wasn't going to try to, to to really over control it, but just try to give it some kind of voice, some kind of musical voice, that is. Yeah, it's amazing that you took speech, essentially, and then rendered it into song, which we'll hear in, in a couple of minutes. Um, if for, for listeners who are interested in reading the play, and in fact, it might be helpful when it comes time to uh, to listen to Dan Warner's piece is, is to read along with it, you can uh, click on the link that's at the bottom of the YouTube page there um, and access the sc- Gertrude Stein's text um, of an exercise in analysis. And if uh, if you do that, you'll notice that it's it's really hard to even know how to read the play as a performance in the first instance, since it's consists of a large number of act and part titles. Uh, each followed by sentences. So at first, it just looks like it's a it's a mess. Like this is a whole bunch of of titles, uh, and you don't know what the relation is between the titles and the sentences that follow them. Um, and then at some point, uh, I realized I think that that you could read these titles as names of four voices, and, and the four voices are Act Two, Act Three, Act Four, and then a name that begins as a play and becomes part X, where X is a Roman numeral from 2 to 60. And so then you end up having these four voices. uh, And if you get four people together to read it, as we started doing in the workshop, and as I've done in classrooms as well, the play begins to emerge as an amusing, skewed exercise in analysis of the competitive and collaborative relations among these voices. And that's what I tried to arrange for in the recording. um, I would like to... I'd like to say something about your treatment of that. Um, um, you, uh, of course, gave me what was in effect a, a, a treatment of this uh, original play that was um, at, uh, a la Gertrude Stein, very unstructured in terms of how one how one would approach it. Um, the other thing that I thought was really great was that you what you imagined was that the right the the characters in the play or opera um, were riding in a car. So that there was a driver and there were three passengers in the car and they were in close proximity and also able to engage in a kind of banter in a kind of back and forth that was that was really interesting. And of course, that made that I really took that very uh, I took that to heart. And what I tried to do in my setting was to was to try to create underneath a very simple sound, uh, musical soundtrack that was a kind of motoric, um, forward-moving, motion-inducing uh, kind of uh, underpinning for the for the words. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're going to hear in a second that it, your 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 treatment of it really moves. I love that it moves all the way forward from the beginning to the end, and in, in a in a in a couple of motions that really. Are, are very persuasive to me. Uh, I'll just say a word or two about that choice of setting. Um, so an exercise in analysis is one of the plays that Stein wrote during the First World War. Uh, she started really writing these plays intensively when she was on the island of Mallorca, where she and Alice Tokas had retreated to uh, to get away from the air raids and coal shortages in Paris. 
Um, she was there for a, a little over a year, a year and a half or so, and then she um, returned to Paris uh, and had learned how to drive. Uh, William Cook, who is an artist friend of hers who drove a taxi, uh, uh, taught her how to drive, and she uh, got a Ford uh, motor car sent over and uh, drove it for the American Fund for French Wounded as a supply truck, basically. And so one of the contexts, I think, for this 1917 play is the image of Stein and Toklas driving through the French countryside, maybe um, giving lifts to soldiers or something like that. Um, and then the other setting for it was sort of uh, the idea that there was sort of, you know, mom and dad in the front seat and then two kids in the back seat. And there's something about the way these four voices are talking to each other, uh, someone clearly trying to call the shots, another one trying to one up or undermine some of those shots and then the kids in the back seat commenting ironically on on this relationship um that i tried to capture that uh in the treatment and and then we'll see um we'll see how that makes itself felt in the uh in the music um so shall we listen to it you, you want to go ahead and listen to it and then come back for more discussion and q a after that yeah um Sorry, I was muted. That sounds great. Okay, good. Okay. So uh, let me just give you um, listeners a sense of the, the credits here. Uh, the, the play itself and Dan Warner's setting for it is about 13 minutes long. I, I do recommend listening while reading along with Stein's play. That may help with the words. And um, the play itself was, uh, the, the recording was directed by James Fagan Tate uh, with Patty Allen as part or part X. Emilia Symington Fetty as Act Two, Evan Frain as Act Three, and Kevin McDonald as Act Four. We recorded it in June 2017 at Dick and Rogers Sound Studio in Vancouver, and Don Harder was the sound engineer. Uh, did you have any other recommendations, Dan, for, for listening? <clears throat> yeah, I think it would be great if the listeners could wear headphones, just because, as you probably know, the little speakers in our computers reproduce, um, well, not very much. So if you can possibly put on headphones, plug in headphones to your computer, that would be probably in this situation, the optimum listening uh, condition. Great, thanks. Okay, so enjoy this. And um, after, uh, after you, we come back from, the, from playing, we'll have a, a discussion. Oh. Uh, if you do want to access the um, the PDF of the play, it's right at the bottom of the YouTube uh, broadcast page uh, that you'll be listening from. An exercise in analysis. A play. Given up analysis. Splendid profit. I have paid my debt to humanity. Very boring. In time, it cannot be protected. And your rights do not see soldiers and then they swim so they do. When we wheel, whether is a turning, that is the meaning of wheel. Acts are longer. Places resemble their mother. They have the beauty of their father and the intelligence of their mother. Oh, long time. Who is the banker? Miss Morton comes first. Extra size play. The divided. Believe in seeing a delay divided is divided between a mother and Mrs. Turner. Can you wish me that? I can wish you wins. All winds take water. I can wish you water. I can wish you a drawing of a little goat in a great deal of work. Work is pleasant to me. You're acting again. We're acting insensibly. He doesn't like the poor. In Barcelona, they do not like the poor. Why did she see when she saw men swimming? Examples of everything. All examples of children. 
Now to ask pets. Now to ask colors. She was so good for life. All the ways of the pigeons, all ways of deception. He did not deceive me. Do not deceive her cousin. Cousin makes powder heat. Can you counsel me? I want to know something, and if them before tell me, may I ask them? Do you feel strong? When? When you write a memory, do you believe in memory and credibility? Do you have winter weather here? We do not allow Mr. Douglas to be contradicted here. We do not desire that he should feel himself beginning to be about to be wrong. Then you agree with whatever he says. I do not say that this is so, I say so. Can you match streets? Can you believe in God? Do you like democracy? Have you a king and grace? There are plenty of places in which to be idle. Not all of them are agreeable. Not when there is likelihood of invasion. But it is here. against me is even doing that again. Doing that again. I hardly said author. This is a This is not an unreasonable carriage. There is plenty of rubber in America and in Europe. In the middle of the river, there is not always water. Not in Spain. Nor in Mexico. Nor in Arizona. Please me when you do please. And in there. Where? In the room. When can you believe me? When can he believe me? When can they say they wonder? When shall we have another? Recollections to Duchess, a dowager Duchess, a husband, a husband and wife. Slamming things. He introduced me. They introduced me too. Can you recollect missing him? Can you follow me quickly? He was a boy. You are once more an American. Can you remember what she said? Can you remember him? He will be glad not to have married Sylvia. He will never be needed in the business. He will never be needed in that business. He is ashamed of his message. She is ashamed of her system. He is never neglected. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks so much. We ask for him. We can send butter. We cannot send butter. Mrs. Turner can come. In the winter. Remember the weather. A kind way. A very kind way. I am really in search of a flavor. So am I. Can you see numbers? Can you read about numbers? And four smiles. I can see what I hear. I can hear too. So can I when I wish. So can Mrs. Turner. Or so can I do you do it? Houses. Can we see the set? The set of what? I borrow you. Why do you have that? Because it pleases me. You said you would not be married. Plenty of space. 
to put things together. There is plenty of space. There is excuse. There is no excuse. Mm. We win today. We went there today. I cannot repeat what they say. Neither can I. Can you speak to me? Can you speak to me here? Can you speak to me about it? Can you speak to me about anything? Can you speak to me? Can you complain today? Can you? Do you know about wishes? I do know all about it. Can you recollect me? What were the opportunities of meeting you? What have you sold? Why are you so certain? I wanna be simple too. Of course you do. Can you come at four? Yes, indeed. Can you understand me? I can understand you very well. Do you agree with Miss Crudwell? I do not. Can you be to blame? Can they be to blame in this? Can they request a question? Do they see they are polite? No, they cannot feel the purpose. No, they cannot have time. No, they can be observant. No, indeed, for me. I do not like such a declaration. Do not tell me about birds. What is a bird? We have suffered. I can hear anything. Something most delicious. And birds and waterfowl. There's plenty to blame. The introductions. Waiting and memory. Please vanish. Please do. Please do be a sailor. Please be womanish. <laughs> <laughs> She knows, so do I. I am not abused. It was a copy. Do not make a mistake, figure. Have a pleasant time. Remain there. I express an opinion. You express an opinion, too. Can you say that you excuse me? Can you say that you excuse him from the room? Can you say anything about it? She doesn't mind. She does not mind. Neither does she mind. We do not mind him. We did not sit down here. Was she the first one to say to his room? Was he the last one here? To be here? Can you see very much? Can you see very much here? Here and there. Can you paint that? The color of that house? Yes, I can. Thank you. Satisfy them. Do satisfy them. Do they make that noise? I do. Can you finish? And make a mistake. And not make a mistake there. And have a treasure. Of course, I have a treasure. Of course, I have so much thought. Do not be ungrateful to me. Can you believe me when I swear? Can you trust me? Can you have a wife? Please do not mention that address to me. Do not believe me when I tell you that it is so insensitive as spread it to Hungary and New York. This was what I meant. Oh, did you indeed? And next time we go, we will go together. Please me, dear, please me. Please me pleasantly. Yes, I will. Can you sing? I have asked you that before. I can ask you again. You can if you like. Can you not vary? By what? By making changes. Oh, yes. 
Why do you wish we should eat differently? You mean less quickly? I mean what I say. Yes, it is true. Can you come together? 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 What is the name of the bedding? It is different. Of course it is different. Can you be foolish? You mean in your thoughts? In recommending a novel. Get all the books you can. Not disappointed. Not in your Call me. Call me. Great. That was Dan's Dan Warner's uh, musical setting for Gertrude Stein's An Exercise in Analysis. Um, we are back here uh, uh, in the thing that is sort of a studio and sort of isn't a studio. Uh, with uh, Dan, and um, I, I love that piece. Uh, is there anything you want to say now that the the, the listeners have listened to it um, before we go to the Q and A? Um, well, I, I I guess I guess the only other thing that I would say is that I I'm very I one of the reasons why I was you know, very interested in trying to you know work on this project was that. I'm very interested in the tradition of experimental sound poetry and the work of Bur Burroughs, his cut-ups, um, his work with tape recorders, of course, to do that, um, all the way to, you know, much more, you know, much more recent sort of punk and industrial um, musics and uh, their, their, um, their interest in, you know, again, in the sort of idea of remixes, rehashings, recyclings, and cutting ups. And I think there's a way in which this, the language of, of uh, Stein's, these early plays is just, you know, so, so fresh sonically in my mind that uh, it was, it was a really, you know, it was just a really wonderful thing to be able to, to work, work with. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Let's let's let's. I'm, we're going to continue having a conversation, but I, I I want to invite more people to participate in it. So um, I think what I want to do now is uh, let people know that the way to uh, ask a question is to click on the Zoom link that's uh, also on the YouTube page, um, and I will admit you. I'm going to admit everyone here, and then I'll uh, basically un unmute you, ask you to unmute yourselves. Uh, and then one at a time, we can uh, begin to take questions and conversations. So, um, okay. Um, the only thing that I have to ask you to do is is to lower the volume on your computer if I've unmuted you, uh, because otherwise there will be feedback on the YouTube, uh, lower the volume on your YouTube link so that we don't get feedback. Okay. Um, the only thing that I... So Meredith, I see someone named Meredith Michaels here. Uh, because otherwise there will be feedback. Right. Uh, Meredith, uh, are are you are you there? And would you like to ask a question? If so, maybe you can uh, raise your hand, or I can unmute you. There you go. There you go. Hold on. Right. Go ahead. You can. Uh... Sorry, I'm just trying to. Okay, you can. If, there you go. Okay, you can. Oh, she's. Uh, she's okay. Uh, I'm gonna have to. Oh, she's. Uh, she's okay. Uh, I'm gonna have to. Okay. Um, 
Meredith? No, I'm something's not right. It just okay. hold on. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go to someone else for now and see how we go. Okay, I'm gonna go to someone else for yeah. now. And see yeah, yeah. Okay, Kevin. Thanks. I can show my face here, maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> behind my hey. Uh I was really interested in so the the kind of uh I guess musical textures, the sound textures there were they sounded very, very electronic in the sense I guess they're sine waves or something like that. Uh well, so I'm I'm kind of wondering about that choice in general. I mean, I know we're working with Stein, you're working with Stein mediated. So everything's electronic in, in a, a lot of, in one sense or another. But uh, I'm curious about maybe, Daniel, if you could talk a little bit about why you chose something that sounds so electronic, that doesn't try to fake the organic in some way. Although there, I heard Adam's voice come in at one point. <laughs> Yes, and the, so there the were one, some kind of organic sounding voices there, but for the most part, it's very processed and very electronic in that kind of, uh, I don't know what the right word is for it. It's kind of on the nose in terms of being electronic. So I'm wondering why, why you made that choice for this particular piece, as opposed to uh, maybe a different kind of palette, a different kind of sound mix, something like that. Uh, the the Okay, so there are some practical reasons as well as some uh, musical reasons. I'm primary, primarily an electronic music composer. Um, and so I, my sense early on was that if I were to try to set this language um, in a traditional setting, it would require, you know, musical forces that I wasn't necessarily sure that I could, you know, muster at the time. That's one thing. But I think the most important thing for me is that I really, you know, because I'm primarily an electronic composer, I really heard these sounds as electronic. I actually had done a kind of study for this piece, which was a setting of a uh, of a poem by W. S. Merwin about a year before I started this project um, using the vocoder, and um, I was really just really happy with the, the 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 sound, the sense of it, and in a certain sense, the disembodiedness of it, because I think in a certain sense, the, you know, I, I, I believe that, that, that this notion of the, as I mentioned earlier, of the words having a kind of, you know, material sense and, um, and, and having a place, you know, visually and sonically, to me, it was great to be able to think about something that was electronic that I could control from beginning to end. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we do electronic music. Composers do electronic music really is to, is to have that, um, that sort of complete control of the process from one, one end to the other. Kevin, did you wanna uh, ask something else or are you okay with uh, getting me going on to another person? Maybe I could just uh, add to that. I mean, uh, th despite the the kind of con I guess immediacy and contemporaneity and a sort of machinic quality, maybe if that's I, I don't mean that in a negative sense at all. But no, this I'm... takes on. It also I mean I I really love the idea of of working with a vocoder because it also sounds like to me uh, maybe you can correct me, but it sounds very dated. It sounds like archaic. It has a certain archaism about it that that's I find really appealing. Absolutely. In fact, when when Adam first heard this piece, he said he really liked it because it sounded very quote unquote 80s. Well, you know, that the sound of the vocoder I attribute mostly to Laurie Anderson, whose big hit in 1981 was Oh Superman. And that's a that's a piece of music that I teach regularly in my electronic music classes and in my audio culture course and history of electronic music and so on and so that that sound is very is really very much in my ear i would say in my ears and um and i just realized that um it was something that um you know could still be could still be used despite its um you know it's somewhat archaic nature. I mean, the other interesting thing about the vocoder is, is that it was actually originally developed about 1928. So it's even more archaic than you than you might think. Um, and um, so that 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 sort of notion of it to me is is really, really interesting. And I, you know, it, it shows up in a lot of techno and a lot of other kinds of electronic music, so sort of robotic voices and stuff like that. 
that is not as interesting as what other people like Laurie Anderson have done with a vocoder. I mean, in, ca in the case of Laurie Anderson, I mean, I'm very interested, for example, in all of the gender bending that she has done with the vocoder over the years, not just in O Superman, but other pieces, um, you know, where she has this character where she's a guy, you know, and so she d uses the vocoder to sort of lower her voice. And of course that appealed to me very much to think when I think about the queerness of uh, Gertrude Stein. Great. Um, uh, yeah, the 80s really did seem to come back uh, to me when I was listening to this for the first time. And then I, I was also a little bit thinking about sort of some of Robert Ashley's pieces, uh, the, yes. kind of, uh, yeah. the kind yeah. of insistence on the harmonic, kind of very harmonic and, and very kind of um, propulsive. There's a kind of propulsiveness uh, yes. that, yes. that really... Good, 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 good addition to the, to the sound palette there would be the work of Robert Ashley, absolutely. Okay, I think um, uh, there's a question from Marguerite. Let's. Uh... Yeah, hi, uh, Danny. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, we can't hear you. Uh, maybe you can lower the volume on your um, on the YouTube and on your computer. Okay. Vaguely. Wait, um, I'm as loud as I think I can. Okay, that's good. Just, uh, I'm interested, as I read the play while I was listening to your piece, which I really enjoyed, um, I was so struck by how short and uh, abrupt Stein's lines are, and uh, the contrast between that and your music, which seemed to flow uh, forward in this endless kind of almost futuristic stream for me. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that contrast between those two, the two her words, which keep going click, 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 click and click. your music? Now that's, I, I think that's, I think you've, you've definitely heard something in there that's very, uh, very much, was very much in my ear too, which was the clip, clip, clip of this interplay, this banter, if you will, going back and forth. All different kinds of things, little dirty jokes, innuendos, uh, obviously, you know, non sequiturs that, you know, just, sort of come out of nowhere. Um, and I, again, I was, what I was trying to think here mainly was to pick up on Adam's idea that these four characters, this was it from his treatment, that these four characters are riding in the, riding in a car. And to me, a car, you know, means motion and means a kind of forward uh, momentum that, uh, and of course, what I was really imagining was we would be out on the highway. We wouldn't be in like, start and stop traffic. We'd be just out sort of cruising, as you said, Adam, in the French countryside. And, uh, and, and this, this, this sort of complete, um, this very, very liquid interplay be amongst the four, the four, uh, the four characters. Um, and I just really felt that what it needed was something to sort of keep it moving in the, uh, as if they were in a car. So it had a lot to do with Adam's treatment, actually. Yeah, I like that contrast, the contrast between a kind of almost circular, I mean, because even though all the voices are quite clipped and abrupt, and they have this kind of dueling quality, there's still this this circle, they, they keep on going in a circle over and over again. So there's a, both a stasis and a, and a kind of a, yeah, yeah. there's a, quite a lot of stasis. And I think the music kind of gets gets us gets us with the propulsive stasis kind of thing. The other thing I noticed as I worked with the language was the way in which it would, you know, the way in which, you know, an, one of the voices coming in would, would, would disturb that stasis and then set it off into a new loop. And I think that's another really, really interesting thing about, about Stein's uh, language here. Um, it, right. It's, you know, the more that I worked with it, the more impressed I was with the, you know, the, 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 the craft of this of this original play. Hmm. All right, um, I'm gonna see whether M M Meredith Michaels uh, is uh, available, but I I'm trying to ask to unmute, and I'm not sure that it's working. Ah. Hi, I'm uh, sorry to have been. Um, we were having technological difficulties, and then other kinds as well. <laughs> so, um, and I've been hearing about this. Uh, this piece um, off and on for a, a while, and it's wonderful to hear it in its um, uh, 
I think it should be its ultimate form. Um, and I was so struck by um, uh, the, the, the way in which, um, Dan, you made a reference earlier to, and I don't remember who's, who, uh, who it was who said, said that, you know, thinking about Stein's, the way in which he thought about word, words and objects. And that's what really struck me was the, the way in which, um, the very interesting way in which a certain kind of objectification occurs during the process of the, uh, as the, the sort of unfolding and the way in which the sound and the words um, are both uh, in a sense obviously synchronous, but then also these, these the ways in which their disruption, the sound enables a kind of disruption of that. Um, and um, just very much a, a creating a kind of the possibility of, of seeing these word sounds, um, what phonemes, but seeing them independently of their, uh, what we think of as their meaning, right. you know, their, their so the sort of semantics shift. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what I no, think. I can't hear Dan. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? You can go ahead and, and okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think that the um, uh, let's see, and this, this sort of gets back to what I was saying about my interest in experimental sound poetry, which was that even going back to the early Russian uh, poets, that the idea that language could be uh, could be treated in ways cut up in ways, fragmentized in ways that would still allow meaning to come through, right? And um, that that to me is really, really, um, you know, it's just a really, for, for me, was a really, really exciting way to to be able to, to approach this. So that what I was doing, what I was trying to do was to work with these, these words, these fragments, these, uh, these little snippets of things, and to sort of say, okay, what, what happens? You know, what happens to the meaning if I, if I, if I, um, um, you know, sonify that 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 little phrase in a certain way, and um, that that playfulness, I think, you know, is 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 the part of this that was really interesting to me and was something that I, you know, I really wanted to try to try to work with in the, you know, when I did the setting. Um, yeah, and analysis, of course, is is precisely that kind of cutting up, frag, frag, fragmenting, right? To to cut up into little parts and then recombine in other parts. And and it's interesting to think about how, um, even though it is so abrupt in some ways and so fragmented in, in the languages, that nonetheless there's still this kind of uh, propulsiveness and and through mm -hmm. through through line and continuity that that somehow emerges as well and i think that that contrast is is it w works really well as as an experience um I, there's a few other people here i'm gonna marguerite Whitvote. would you uh i'm gonna unmute you if you have a comment and maybe not um, Ju uh, Judith is here. Hi. 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 Yes, I, well, I was interested in, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was interested in your reference to Laurie Anderson because, um, uh, uh, and the way that you use that, I enjoyed that. I also enjoyed the, the 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 way the voices kind of came in and out of uh, recognition as as words. I like I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did recognize Adam's voice coming in a couple of times. Yes, I, I was gonna I was gonna point out that there's one there's one line in the play that Adam determined came completely from outside the car which is when somebody says, thank you. And so it was kind of a, it was kind of a, an in joke be, a, a between the two of us that it would be Adam's voice that would, that would thank us. Right. And so that's why, that's why there's one voice in there, which is Adam's that is not 
electronically transformed at all. <laughs> right. I mean, just sheerly technical. There were there suddenly about two thirds of the way through the play. There's a there's a um, there's an act five and an act six actually. So there's there's two sentences that that don't seem to belong to the play. Uh, so Jimmy Tate, who is the director, and I decided that those would be our voices. I would just throw we would throw us in uh, at that point. So yeah. All right. I think. Um, oh, Judith, did you want to add something? And I know. Uh, hold on, I've, I've muted you again. You're you're muted, Judith. I tried to access the plays, but I couldn't find that link because I was on YouTube originally, and then I tried to get into the Zoom. So anyway, you could maybe address that later. Okay. If Marguerite is here to. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask uh, Marguerite. I know she wants to. Uh, she's she's available now. Hey there, Adam. <laughs> Um, I, I'm sorry, I just got a phone call in the middle there, so I wasn't sure what you were asking me. Oh, well, it sounded like, uh, so the Zoom link is just for people who have Q&A, who have questions or comments on, on, the, uh, on, the musical, on the music or on Stein, in case you had any comments. So it's... Oh, I caught the very, very tail uh, okay. end Okay, no and, problem. Uh, it sounded very electronic and kind of like, uh, you know, Cher singing into her little... <laughs> I wasn't sure if I if I was hearing language or not, uh, but uh, it was it was intriguing, and uh, I, I wish I had caught more of it. But it took me a while to kind of navigate the links and the. Right. I, I went on to the um, Zoom call first, and then right. I wasn't let in. And yeah. okay, yeah. So I'll just I'll just clarify a couple of things, and and just so people know, the the YouTube broadcast link is the way we'll be uh, broadcasting these uh, these events, and that'll be happening every second Wednesday from now. So if anyone wants to uh, come and. Uh, listen in again in two weeks time. Uh, there'll be an interview with Samuel Vriesen who did the musical setting for Stein's first play called What Happened? And we'll, we'll uh, be talking to him and playing excerpts from that piece. Um, and then the Zoom is basically we're using it like a telephone call in. So uh, if you wanna have a question or a comment, you can click on the Zoom link and, uh, and join in uh, there. Um, so, uh, and I think otherwise I feel like uh, does anyone have any, any other uh, questions or comments? And you, you can always um, uh, you can always uh, listen to these pieces. They're all on up of and available on the Radio Freestein website. Um, so if you want to listen to the piece uh, just by itself, uh, you can do that. They're all available there. I also had hoped to um, give people a sense of the of the. There was a version, the recording I initially did uh, that Dan couldn't use. Was a na I did a naturalist version of this, um, so I may just um, ask Josh, who's my sound engineer here, to just play it for a minute or so, so you can get a sense of the kind of material that Dan was working with. Uh, and it's a, we just put car sound effects on it, and you can listen to that for just about a minute to get a, a sense of it. So. An, an exercise in analysis. analysis. A play. A play. I have given up analysis. Splendid profit! I have paid my debt to humanity. Hurry. Climb. In climbing, do not be contented. Run ahead. Run on ahead. Have you a knife? Do not see soldiers ahead. They swim. So they do. Hmm. When we wheel where there is a turning, that is the meaning of wheel. Acts are longer. Places resemble their mother. They have the beauty of their father and the intelligence of their mother. A long time. Who is the packer? Ms. Morton comes first. Extra size plates. Believe in saying divided duty. Believe in saying a delay divided is divided between a mother and Mrs. Turner. Can you, Can you wish, wish me that? Me that? I can wish you winds. All, All winds, winds make, make water. water. I can wish you water. I can wish you a drawing of a little goat in a great deal of work. Work, work is pleasant, pleasant to me. All right, so that was uh, the sort of naturalist version. That's what the actors uh, sound sound like um, when they're not going through the vocoder. Uh, <laughs> so we're coming. We're coming to the end of this um, of this. Uh, hour. So I want to thank Dan Warner very much for, uh, for joining me here. And I want to thank you all, all the listeners for joining us. And again, let you know that uh, we'll be doing something similar with uh, Samuel Vriesen in about two weeks time. 
And I also especially want to thank the Public Humanities Hub at UBC at supporting this. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And uh, Dan, see thank you. Thank you very much. I hope we can find time to hang out another on another occasion in the post-pandemic so. world. Great. Okay. So long, thank everyone. You. Thank you.